Eagles. It is two o'clock Eastern time. So it is time for the Million Acres Hour. Uh, one of the things I've noticed the last few weeks, whenever we do uh, this hour and I start talking about real estate, I get a lot of questions in Slido about people wanting to know about particular markets. So wanted to dive into that today. We can't really give specific advice on your situation, but let's talk some real estate markets. So I have a guest today. Patrick Duffy, he's an economist. He just wrote a piece on millionacres.com about top rental markets, uh, some of them which might surprise people. It's far bigger than just Austin, Texas. Uh, a little bit on Patrick. He's an economist, a consultant. He focuses on real estate and land use. Uh, he also runs a business called Metro Intelligence, his own economics and real estate consulting firm. And he's an investor in short-term and long-term rentals. So he's got a lot to say on this. So welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Deidre. Good to be with here this morning. Happy uh, day after 4th of July, two days after 4th of July. Right. So uh, right now we're kind of in this such a weird real estate space, right? I mean, I'm trying to figure out how to even sort of wrap my head around it. When you're looking at stuff, are you using 2020 data and 2019 data? I'm noticing that some economists are doing that, like because last year's numbers are so kind of off. Yeah, not only go that, but going back further and in, in for this article that's going up on the top rental markets, the database that we built went back to 2014 because we get data back there. But sometimes you get lost in the weeds, so you don't want to get too much data. So ultimately, we looked at the one year, which was, I think, from May 2020 uh, to May 2021. And then we looked at the three year and then we looked at the five year changes. And the three year changes were not that different than what we would see from like a five year. So we want to look at that long-term trend, what is really happening in these areas. But at the same time, you want to look at 2020 and find out how quickly is it bouncing back in terms of rents and home values and also jobs. Like, how's the job market doing? How did that local economy uh, return? So it's just so many different factors to look at. And then you also have things like, how long is this remote, from, uh, remote work from home trend going to continue? because you're starting to see a lot of companies demanding people come back to the offices. And we don't know who's gonna win that, that battle yet. That's still in play. And that's gonna have an impact on real estate markets. Yeah, I think I, I keep calling it the office being the wild card uh, from an investment standpoint, but, also, but you're absolutely right that it also connects directly to where people are living. And we just don't know yet. And so many companies I find have walked back their policies. Like they were like going to say, oh, you can work remotely until 2022. Now they're like, well, we kind of like to have you back in 2021. And so, you know, you've got, you've got people who've leased places. You've got people who've, who've bought places. I keep thinking about Boise, Idaho. Like Boise, Idaho, the prices have gone up so much. There was some core logic data out today uh, that the prices in Idaho in general are up like 30% year over year. I think it was in Boise specifically. Is everyone going to stay in, in Boise or are they going back to California? I, mean, I think that's one of the, the things we need to try to figure out. Yeah, and I think it depends on your situation. If, if I'm a young family and I'm raising kids, then Boise is probably great. But if I'm a young single and I want to look out and I'm looking to find a partner, uh, then maybe Boise is not a big enough market. Maybe it's good for a temporary one or maybe a second home, but then maybe I start to miss the activities and different types of people I can meet in a larger city. So we saw that in the early aughts, people moved to places like Coeur d'Alene, Idaho from LA. They cashed out during that last housing boom. And then after about a year, some of them moved back. They're like, oh, I missed this and this is about LA. So they moved back. So, but we didn't have as much remote work then. So yeah. I think that's going to throw a dish, an additional wrinkle into it. But I think and you're going to have two employers, employers that are kind of paying attention to the cultural shift and allowing more flexibility and then some that don't or they don't care and they really want people in the office. And maybe it's the bigger companies that people are willing to give up uh, that remote work because it's such a good opportunity. You're seeing that with Gen X's or I'm sorry, Gen Z's. Gen Z's, the younger people really want to be in the office more because they're looking at as the opportunity to build relationships with people, to be visible in the workplace. Whereas someone who's like uh, older millennials and Gen X, Maybe they think, well, I've already done that. I've already put in my time. So now it's time for me to enjoy the fruits of my labor with, with remote work from a place like Boise. 
Interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about how it breaks down generationally, but you're absolutely right because uh, when you're in your 20s and, and 30s, especially like early 30s, your office life, at least for me, when I was that age, was my was a lot of my social life. And now, yeah, I don't I don't need that as as much because I have already have existing friendships, relationships, family, etc. So I think that's a really good point, especially with regard to to cities too in general. But I feel like there is a potential, though, when you talk about the millennial generation, some of them are turning 40. We're starting to see some of them wanting to own homes. But, you know, housing affordability this year, you and I have talked about it before. It's it's just ridiculous. And it's gotten to the point. I feel like we're almost I kept thinking before this that we were going to get to that point of critical mass of people that the market's going to slow down because people won't pay the prices. Are we there yet? I mean, we've got 111 months in a, uh, in a row of uh, existing home sales price gains. Well, you're starting to see some inventory come back on the market. The thing is, there used to be this, this sort of um, ratio, we need about six months. And there have been some arguments lately that technology has moved that up to like four months. And I sold a house two years ago. I wish I would have known what was going to happen last year or this year. <laughs> But I was amazed at how fast it was. Just everything was online. I could do the contract online. I could manage things online. That sped up the whole process. I think we had a pretty quick close. And so that six month ratio isn't what it used to be. So I went back out of curiosity. I looked at the months of supply for existing homes in May of 2019, it was 4.3 months. So could you say back in May of 2019, we had a bit more of a balanced market. So now we're like at two and a half months. So that's both well below both four months and six months. So we still have that, that pricing pressure. I think as more inventory comes online, as school, that will be interesting this summer because people are going to start planning their fall. Like kids got to go back to school. We want to be in the house. I have a brother that's going to sell this house hopefully in August. They're going to put on the market. So his, that'll be a really good individual test case for that to see how is that going to modulate prices. And the other thing is interest rates. So I see these prices that seem sort of high, but then you look at the payment and you compare that to rent and you add in the, the tax benefits that might be available to you, depending on where you live. And that can make it a good decision, depending on how long you intend to stay. Because life happens, you know, job changes, and divorces, and new kids and people moving to be closer to family. And that may happen at a point where if interest rates go up, maybe the house prices are going to have to fluctuate accordingly too. Well, you mentioned an interesting point there that I've been thinking about a lot lot lately is the speed of the market. The speed of the market has just gotten nuts. I mean, I think the NAR's most recent numbers were uh, uh, 17 days was the average sale. I've, I've seen houses go on the market and go off the market in 24 hours uh, constantly. And, you know, you've got at the same time, you've got what you talked about before with with the platforms trying to speed up that process. Zillow, Redfin, uh, Opendoor, all of the biggies are sort of working toward making the entire process faster at the same time. So you've got this desire to get the deal. And then you've also got these platforms that are, that are speeding things up, you know, at the, at kind of at the same rate. You know, I've been talking to some people about like how fast can, you know, can a transaction get? And I mean, obviously you've got loans, you've got inspection contingencies, things like that. But I think all of the the major platforms that we're following in and investing in are kind of working to make that transaction happen so much faster. Well, and you also have technology and software inside a brokerage that with the contract signed this, signed this, this disclosure, But in terms of speed, you're also talking about people that are saying, well, we're not going to, we're going to not worry about that inspection. We're not going to worry about, you know, I have a friend that's an escrow on something in Palm Springs. And this is like a $2 million listing. And he was asking another friend who's a banker, what if this comes in below appraisal? Well, he has to kick in extra money. It's coming for the extra money to make the appraisal and the numbers work. So again, for them, that's a long-term investment. They tend to make that retirement home. So they're not doing anything like a flip or anything like that. But that could speed things up too. If you don't need a contingency for financing because you're a cash buyer, that's going to speed things up. I get a little concerned when people get rid of things like inspections because we all heard horror stories about people buying something and then there's 
and even a good inspection may not turn up anything. You might have like foundation issues that depend your inspector didn't come up with. So to just completely waive that, you know, it depends what you do. I know people are contractors that can know what to do and go in and do their own inspections. So for them, because of their expertise, if they're waiving that inspection from a third party, that's probably not as risky as if you have no idea what to look for. Yeah. And people waiving inspections makes me so nervous. And you mentioned the appraisal thing. One of the things that we're seeing too is that, but what you talked about, that appraisal guarantee where someone says, okay, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, uh, you know, appraise for the, for the value of, you know, of the offer, we're going to kick in that extra. That's, I mean, that's scary too. But to me, for some reason, that doesn't scare me as much as waiving inspection contingencies, just because I think I've just seen too many things go so wrong and, you know, foundation issues and roof issues and so many things that that can cost a lot of money that people might people might might not see on the outside but then we'll get a huge bill for in you know in a few months well and then you have condos and you know i bring this horrible thing going on in florida with this condo collapse and maintenance issues and we have this issue i'm on the board of a condo for uh, a place out a second home out in the desert and we constantly come up on history that people don't want to know history. And when you don't want to know history, you repeat the mistakes of the past. So in that, and I bring this up because if you're going to live by a condo, you're becoming a member of a community. You're becoming like a stockholder in that community. So it's incumbent upon you to look at the financials. What are the reserves? What does the reserve study say? Because uh, some people want really low HOA fees, but that could mean assessments down the road. And then Real estate agents know about projects that have a lot of substance, and maybe they'll steer people away from that. So when you start getting new HOAs and condos and townhomes, that brings on a whole different thing. That, And I don't know a lot of people that really get into the nitty gritty of those financials, but that's something that's really important to look at too. It really is. And it has me thinking a lot uh, in, in the wake of the Surfside tragedy, uh, you know, things like assessments and things like that. There's all, there's some talk and I kind of want to get your take on this. Will people be afraid of buying condos? Is, is this going to be a concern that people are going to be afraid of larger buildings? Uh, I mean, this, this tragedy was awful and in some ways looks like it may have been preventable in terms of past inspections, turning up things. What are you thinking about this? Well, I, I saw an article today that older condo buildings in Florida are kind of being, you know, put in a different category of maybe we're not going to take that risk for that reason, because a lot of this is just really age related. And, and then how comfortable agents helping their potential clients get into the nitty gritty of these financials to look at a reserve study, because this is where you really get in the weeds. And that's where a good agent can help you out. You have a good buyer's agent that really knows condos. They could help you steer in those directions. I know when I bought my place that I just mentioned, I had an agent that knew project by project. She knew how strong they were, how popular they were with, with um, snowbirds from Canada. And so she steered me towards different particular communities because she knew about them. Because agents know the reputations of HOAs. It would be interesting to hear on Cersei, what was the reputation of that HOA? And it seemed like and this can happen sometimes. You could be president of an HOA and have little power. You have one vote. You have the power to set the agenda, but you can't make things happen without the support of your board and the support of your association. So I think we'll find out more about that in particular as time goes out. But I would say this is where a really good buyer's agent comes in to help you steer through that because they might have help you find some really good deals. If people are avoiding condos out of fear, and they'll say, no, this is this type of construction. They just have this inspection. Here's this reserve study. You know, everything's A plus. You might get some good deals. Yeah, I think I think that definitely there's going to be some some perception issues that happen with people with condos. People are going to be looking at older condos a little more carefully. Uh, but I mean, on the good side, I think you may see some condo boards uh, be more likely to do. Uh, something that's going to like fixing a roof or something, even if it's going to have a large assessment, just because I think the, the owners may realize that this, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's, it's no fun to have to chip in, you know, five or $10,000 for, for the, for the roof of an entire building, but it's, it's also, it's very necessary. Well, in the case of Surfside, it would have been over a hundred thousand for a special assessment based yeah. on 
the number of units they had. Just a quick math I did, I thought that would be an unfortunate surprise. And, and that's right. one of those things where you look at those sorts of things. Um, so people don't like HOA fees, but you know, it, if you're charging a fee and you're able to put at least a third or more away towards your reserve fund, you could avoid those assessments and you keep up on maintenance. But you have to have a board of directors that respects that too, that is all sort of on the same page. And that's again, where a good buyer's agent can probably help you get through those weeds. Such an important decision. Well, I'm also wondering if this this is going to if it how long will this impact perception of condos? Because sometimes when something happens, there's a there's a half life of uh, you know how long it sticks in in memory. Unfortunately, that's just sort of the way life works. But I'm wondering what developers will be changing things. I certainly think that it's going to have this this longer term impact. You know that article I read this morning about that they they said who knows months not years, a matter of months. So months could be it. And I guess too, it depends on the construction. There was a time, again, 15 years ago or something, uh, where builders, regular single family builders were starting to build high rise condos, but that wasn't their bread and butter. So I would look at who built this, do they experience in building this type of product type? Now you see builders getting a lot more into mixed use, uh, what they call condos over podium, concrete podium, structure, substructures, and they're getting really more comfortable with that. So that is becoming the bread and butter. So like a Toll Brothers that normally built single family now builds all sorts of luxury homes that are condos and townhomes. And so I guess it depends on who built this and do they, do they know what they were doing at the time, especially if it was an older project. Well, let's talk about home builders because that's one of the things that uh, you have expertise in. It's something that, you know, I think you had a really good point there. Toll Brothers, uh, Lennar, others are building different types of properties than they used to just build homes for individual sale. Now you've got single family built to rent. You've got townhouses. You've got uh, Lennar is doing some interesting things with multi-generational uh, properties where you've got in-law suites, separate entrance, uh, you know, which is also great for someone who's going to like house hack or get rental income. How is, how is all of that going to contribute to, you know, making enough housing stock? Because we need millions of homes that, you know, that cut, that don't exist right now. Yeah. And and it depends where that, and we talked about markets where it's going to be. And I think some builders are sort of a little reticent, like exactly what's this demand going to be. And there's certain Mm -hmm. markets like Texas is just, you know, almost every market in Texas is doing really well. And there's certain markets where it's just easier to build. It's flat. Yes. They have government that's more pro uh, and people that really want to see this growth. You have geography that helps a lot. So Texas, Georgia, Florida, Arizona, California, we have all these different ecosystems. We have mountains, we have valleys, we have deserts. And then you have people that aren't as meaningful to growth, right? Because they don't want, it's the NIMBYism here. So you do have some of that. Uh, you mentioned multi-generational housing. That's something that we've seen ebb and flow over the last years. One of the benefits of that, though, is you have multiple people come in. They can benefit, they can combine their income, get a larger mortgage, and get a bigger house. So I think a lot of it comes down to creativity. Uh, there's another client we're working with that does uh, where they're improving the process of production so you could customize homes without the additional cost because you're using software to make it much more um, quick to build, change orders are easier to implement, their throughput's like 30% faster. So I think we're gonna see a lot of change just through creativity and technology. And there've been hits and misses in this space. Um, Different companies that are gonna completely change how we construct. And I don't know if that's where it's gonna come from. I think it's gonna be, how do we improve the way that we construct homes? How do we make it faster? And it's not just getting people who are politicians and city councils to approve it. It's to educate people that it, it, we have a big homeless problem here for California too. And right. part of that is because we don't build enough housing. So people who live in Venice who complain about housing say, well, what if we wanted to do a, a you know, high density building for homeless here? And, well, not in my community. Okay, well, then where are they supposed to go? So I think collectively with society have to look at all of these challenges and then let for builders catch up too you're having some supply issues lumber futures were sky high now they've come down Mm -hmm. this is some of the supply bottlenecks are starting to be figured out 
but that's going to be dependent on some markets. Some markets, you just can't even still find the supplies, no matter what you want to pay. So it's going to take some while, a few more months to come out of that. Yeah, the, you just mentioned like so many things I want to talk about, but okay. let's start with um, with lumber. You're absolutely right that the it was up uh, 400% year over year, and then it went down to 60%. I think lumber futures were the lowest they've been in you know in years. All of a sudden, and so then of course everybody thinks, oh well, the lumber short you know lumber shortage is over. That lumber isn't a concern anymore. But we've had spikes in lumber prices before. We're going to have them again. I feel like that's that that's a little short sighted. And the supply chain issues you mentioned, uh, certainly appliances. I know that the delays. I mean, we're still feeling the impact of the Suez Canal problem. Uh, you know, months ago, in terms of getting getting some things shipped over, seems like that's starting to shift. But I know that that's impacted the home builders as well. Yeah, it's. I remember I was out here. This picture behind me is where the San Gabriel River empties into the Pacific Ocean, um, where I live in Southern California. And out there, I counted like twenty four ships just waiting to unload at at the twin ports of Los Angeles, Long Beach. So we do have that. It's it takes a while. You have like this huge economy, and the U.S. economy right now is driving the world. Like we've not been in this place for a long time. And so it takes a while for an economy this big and complex to grind back up after such a, a rapid shutdown. And I think that's not what some people necessarily appreciate sometimes, that these things take some time. And like you said, like the lumber is starting to come down. I think the appliances probably on those ships, there's a bunch that are going to be unloaded. <laughs> it, just be patient. I, I know that's troubling. You know, you buy a new home, you want to move in, and you're not going to have any appliances. It's like, how's that going to work? So I think people are just being creative and asking for patience as they move through this. And I think builders are doing a great job now with technology to keep people in, um, it, keep them informed. And it's amazing how much builders have done. They had already done a lot before the pandemic. But now if you look at websites compared to what builder websites are like a few years ago, it's, it's night and day now. You can just look at almost everything and make decisions. You don't have to tour the model complexes. And so that's actually also sped up things. So that's great for their backlog, but that's not necessarily great for sticking to timetables when things happen outside of their, you know, out of their control. Yeah, that's a really good point. You mentioned before, uh, alternative manufacturing. Uh, wondering if you have a pit, an opinion on what happened with Katera. Katera was like that hope for manufacturing, uh, you know, modular construction. We're going to rebuild the world. I was totally sucked in by it. Luckily, not an investable idea. Uh, you know, SoftBank gave them so much money. They grew so rapidly. They filed chapter 11 uh, last month. It's there were certainly some management issues, but do you feel like there is potential for factory built modular to to really build at scale? We've got a f there, there's a few companies that are doing it, but no one has really been able to do it at the scale that Katera was was planning to. I think the key is to bring in people who know the business. It's like learning from history, right? Like don't forget the history. And from what I've read at Katera, they had brought in a bunch of people that weren't necessarily building industry insiders because they thought oh, we're going to completely redo this way. Well, then there's all sorts of lessons that you don't learn on. that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to come and we're going to change how you do things. So I think the, the ones that will do better are the ones that are going to work hand in hand and hire people from inside the industry that knows how it works, that knows the day to day of constructing houses. So they can raise their hand and say, wait, I don't know if this is going to work. Because of this specific, you know, it could be a physics, it could be a physics question. It's not going to work because of this. We can't do that. But that same person, hopefully, will help you find a solution to that. So I, I think, to your point, we're going to find more of those lessons learned. We're going to bring in more people, have an advisory board of people who have expertise in this, and still bringing these brilliant minds from the software world and other and engineering worlds in order to make this the, the whole business of home building more efficient. It, it's been something we've tried to do for decades. Absolutely. I noticed over the weekend, uh, it was announced that Elon Musk is living in a, uh, he's living in a prefab casita. It's a, um, I forget the name of the company, but uh, a boxable. So okay. it's a, um, 
it's got the little, it, it's basically a, it's kind of like a pop-up house. So he's in a, a, like a 350 square foot, like little studio house. But I have a feeling that, the, you know, anytime Elon does anything, everyone sort of pays attention. So it'll be interesting to see if that sort of makes people more aware of modular and uh, accessory dwelling units and things like that. You know, if, if Elon lives tiny, maybe, maybe everyone else can. You mean if someone that had several giant houses is <laughs> right. I'm done with that, I'm just yeah. going to sell that. <laughs> yeah. And I, I heard this on a podcast too. So I can't remember, but it was a celebrity had a pig house and he's like, God, he says, I, it was so much easier when I was living in an apartment and I wasn't a homeowner and I didn't have to think about these things. So I think for someone like Eon, who has enough on his plate already, not to have to worry <laughs> about his housing could be part of that decision. It's ju- it's it's also simplifying the living. Well, we've got a question I wanted to ask you from uh, Janie McFool. Can you comment on the home market in California and other Western states facing severe drought for the next 10 to 20 years? Yeah, that's a thing. I think about that in Phoenix, too. Yes, definitely. a lot of this goes to water rights. Where are the senior water rights? And California has some senior water rights versus other states because we pull from the same sword, the Colorado River in that case. Mm-hmm. And then I look at how close, like here we're near the coast and we have several desalination plants up and down the coast. And that is expensive, but it's possible. And it's something they do routinely in Israel and Saudi Arabia. So that's an option. Whereas if you're in the middle of the country in a desert and you have the potential for drought, what does that mean? Does that mean pipelines? I think here we're trying to, to reuse all of our existing water. So California has actually been really good about using about the same amount of water for its households, despite rapid population growth. And a lot of that's just been more efficient. So I, I just recently zero escaped my front yard because I'm preparing for the drought. Because a few years ago, when it got cut down, I had some beautiful trees die because you just couldn't get enough water. So I think it depends on how they're planning for it. And are you living in a state where they're actively planning? Now, a, a, a lot real quickly, a lot of them, you have to prove you have water for a certain amount of years before you can get approved. So that's certainly the case here in California. And I think a lot of that comes down to efficiency. Do you think that's going to impact home prices in any way? Because one of the things I'm thinking about, I think about the opposite side, uh, Florida, sea level rise. You have some places where uh, a 30-year mortgage is doesn't really make sense in some places. They're not even offering 30-year mortgages. Do you think we're going to see something similar on, on the West Coast where there might be certain areas that people are going to say, you know, you want to live out, you know, deep in uh, Imperial Valley, may, may, maybe maybe the water can't get there. Maybe it's not going to be sustainable for the long term. Yeah. And well, then you have, then you look at water rights and Imperial County has a whole very complex water rights thing. So that might be a case where you're actually okay with water because of your senior water rights. Of course, that may be unfair to the people in Arizona. Like why are they, it's just the way that history worked out. So uh, then you mentioned sea level rise and we have some of that. We have some communities here in my community of Long Beach that are like three, six feet above sea level. So I wouldn't necessarily um, maybe invest there. I, I, you can look up how, with the elevation of your houses. And so I looked that up here, which is like 40 feet. So, but when you talk about places in, in Florida, that's a wake up call, I think, in a way where they're not sure if it's because of sea level rise of that collapse, it could just be a pool deck. Pool decks are always a problem, especially when you have them built over a garage. So it may just come down to that. But I remember reading stories about people buying properties in Miami and thinking, well, that's 50 years from now. Well, maybe it's not 50 years from now. And I think you're starting to see people think about that a lot more. Yeah, the, the point about uh, where a pool is located is important, too, because you also have a lot of developments with rooftop pools, not even a pool over a garage, but a pool at the top of the building or something like that. And pools, I mean, that part of the problem is water is so heavy. You've really got this this very heavy you know pressure on, on top of a building. Yeah, and then it's like one of those things, you know, I had a new patio concrete a couple of years ago and because she's like I don't want it to crack and they're like of course it's going to crack but the question is why and so pools are probably going to leak over time so you have to be prepared for that and have maintenance over that and I guess in the case in Florida 
that it was an engineering mistake. They didn't slope the pool deck so you'd have water running off. So that's what's contributed to the leaks. And I know people that have, you know, managed condo communities where you have that pool over another area underneath. It's just a constant problem. It's almost not worth it, but people want those pools. That's why people buy in high rise condos. They want those amenities. They want the pool, the spa, the, the views. And, and so they're willing to pay those HOA fees. But the other unwritten part of that is we got to maintain this. You know, right. high rise buildings are very complicated to maintain. Absolutely true. Uh, I've got a question from Yair Brings the Light uh, asking about any thoughts uh, on HubZoo or uh, options that allow you to list on the MLS without using a realtor. Uh, uh, he says, uh, I'm selling my parents' house for them and I can't justify the realtor fee. They call it marketing. All they do is post on the MLS. I'm not quite so sure I agree with that. You know, I, I feel like uh, the value of the real estate agent is not as much in the, I mean, certainly is in the marketing in the house and putting it on the MLS, but it's a lot of it is just going through the transaction and all of the things that can go wrong because there's no such thing. I don't think as a seamless real estate deal, even though a lot of the iBuyers are getting to that point of a seamless real estate deal. But, but if you're just on the, on the regular, you know, traditional market, that's probably not going to happen. There's always something. What do you think I would about say, that? Uh, how comfortable is he, he with um, selling and buying? If you've done it before, because I've tried this. I tried going with the discount broker and then I wasn't happy with them. And then I tried just doing the listing. And then I found an agent that already had a buyer for my unit who was a neighbor. So I went with her because it was just worth it. And she helped go through it. But I think she would tell me, well, you make it easier because you've been through this whole process before. If he's new to it, if he has time and he has, you know, wants to try it out on a test, that'd be one thing. But they still recommend you have someone on your side to help you with everything. That you maybe you pay them some commission, but I, it's a risk. If if he wants to get it done in a certain amount of time, there are all sorts of people that offer negotiable commissions. Commissions, you know, here it's six percent. A lot of times it's five percent, but they're technically negotiable. And it's, it's about finding the right agent that he's comfortable with and what the timeline is and his patience for being distressed. So, because if you do everything yourself and this is all new to you, then it's going to be a really, maybe a not a great experience. But if you have someone that you're working with on both ends, that it's, it's, I think it's worth it if you're new to it and you need that expertise. Otherwise he's taking a risk. But if he's really comfortable with it. What do you think about Redfin and others that are offering dis discount commissions? Do you feel like the commission is is going away? I mean, I invest in some, some uh, real estate brokerages. So clearly, I still believe there's value in the traditional market. But I'm curious what, what your take is. Well, I, I've done those experiments and, that I just mentioned. And I didn't really get a chance for the just the listing only because then I found that agent that had a buyer. But I did try another one. Um, and it wasn't a good experience because they just didn't have enough people to help me in that particular case. It wasn't Redfin. It was it's someone else. So, um, it's, I think that you're always going to have people come in because it's such an emotional purchase that you need some amount of handholding, that you need someone you trust. So I had thought technology would kind of get rid of you know, that handholding, it, it would replace a lot of that. But once I went through it personally, I thought, I don't think so. I think you're going to still have agents, good agents. <laughs> so if you talk to real estate agents, the number one complaint from real estate agents is agents that aren't great agents. Yeah. So the key is to find really good agents. And I found all mine through referrals over the years, just through personal referrals and online reviews help with that. But they walk you through the different processes because so many different things could come up over time. So if you're new to doing something, whether you're buying or selling, I think going for an agent, that if you could try to negotiate discounts, but these days with so many offers coming in above listing price, what does it matter? You know, it, this is probably not a bad time because the demand so strong to go with that full service agent, because you're going to get all that, that additional handling for some people know it, but just not the headaches. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I want to pivot a little bit and talk about short-term rentals and the Airbnb market in general, because 
I feel like last year, pandemic happened. A lot of people that had an Airbnb uh, and were using it to generate income, bad, bad year. Now we seem to be so back. I mean, the roads this weekend were crazy. People I know who have Airbnbs are booked up all the way through, you know, through the end of the year and sometimes into next year. What are you thinking about the short-term rental market and Airbnb? You know, I'm trying to find this data. I was going through all this kind of preparing for this today, and I can't remember what it was, but oh, here it is. Long-term stays in Airbnb are up because of this remote work. Mm -hmm. So stays of four weeks or more almost doubled between 2019 and the first few months of 2021, which is really interesting. So if you know what you're doing, but of course, the elevation of being a host on Airbnb has changed a lot too, that you have to be able to kind of emulate what you get in the hotel more. So I think you're going to get people that are kind of like doing that. They like the hosting or they have the services they can outsource with. But again, this is something I think is going to, we're going to see play out over the next few months. So I've done both. I've done the short term versus the long term. There's a lot more work involved with the short term, but the yields can be a lot higher. And some mm-hmm. of the markets we looked at, the very basic gross rental yield of what you can get per month versus what you paid for the house before expenses. So it doesn't get an nitty gritty of that. It's a very simple calculation, but it was double for short term rentals if you kept, kept it occupied versus what you get for a long term rental. But you also have more costs. You have the commissions you got to pay, you got to make sure it's furnished. So it's, it's such a sea change in how people live, but it's gaining acceptance more. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't write that off. I think people are much more willing to, to travel and step in other people's shoes, if you will, into their homes. And what it's going to come down to is how flexible employers are. Yeah, the, well, and it's interesting for on Airbnb, then you have that choice. Do you take the, the, the renter who wants you know two months, three months, or do you go for that shorter term Bring, bringing people in, you know, two, three day, week long stays. And then, you know, but also dealing with more wear and tear on your property, perhaps, or, you know, cleaning fees, all of that. You know, there's so many different considerations now. I think it, it's, it's an interesting thing that we've gone from, you have a choice of short-term rental, long-term rental. Now there's kind of all this range in the middle of, be, because the use cases have shifted, like you mentioned with remote work. Yeah. And I think you can get a really good sense of what they prefer on what discount they offer for a longer term rental. So on Airbnb and VRBO and some of these others, so you have your nightly rate, which is a percentage discount from your nightly, and then you have your monthly rate. And monthly rates can be 30% or more. And it, it the, the steeper it is to me, that's more an indication that that host kind of prefers the longer term rents. I once rented a place for three months and that was kind of where they had several rooms, so I became a de facto host after a few months because I just became really familiar with it. And I think they almost prefer that because they have this constant uh, influx and, and of different people coming in. So, but if you're looking to rent, I think looking at the discount will indicate what they prefer. Now, some people, because of the higher rate, are going to want those two and three night rentals. But now you're seeing condos saying, wait, there's too much hotel and too many strangers. We're going to mm-hmm. slap a 28 day minimum like we do out. In, in Palm Springs now and other desert communities and different cities are doing this. We want 28 or 30 days or more as a minimum because we don't want to turn what is a residential building into a hotel. Yeah, that makes sense. A uh, question or a comment from Grant. He says, I've sold my own homes twice in Madison, Wisconsin, Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, both times worked with a real estate lawyer, both times paid thousand dollars. Easy peasy, maybe not for everyone, but the lawyers took me through the entire process. Yeah, so that, that, that's, that's another option. That is an example where it's like hire someone uh, where you are hiring an attorney to take you through that. So, and in other states outside of California, you often do have a lawyer that handles the escrow process for you. So here we have escrows. So they kind of handle that. But in other states, especially where, I don't know where they did that in the state he's at, but going through attorneys is one of those things that's mentioned if you are going to do it by yourself. Now, it sounds like he's really comfortable with it easy peasy. So he's been through it before, or maybe he had such a good attorney that walked him through it. So he didn't need that. But again, especially for buyers, it's such an emotional thing 
You know, mm -hmm. if you're a buyer, I would certainly want to be represented. If I'm a seller, I think it depends on how comfortable I am with it. But in my own personal experience, it was faster and easier to just go the traditional route. Well, it's interesting, too, because uh, a few days ago, we had the National Association of Realtors and Department of Justice. Uh, there was that uh, agreement for a settlement on uh, buyer's agent disclosures and uh, putting buyer, the um, buyer's agent commission in the MLSs. The DOJ uh, voided out that that uh, agreement. So that that sets us up for a larger probe about agent commissions to gonna we're gonna kind of go through that whole process again. And we've seen this in different states too, that there's just a lot of uh, a lot of concern about the consumer aspect of commissions in that they're not necessarily clear to to buyers, especially that buyers don't know they think that the uh, commission it's free. And it's it's not free. It's you know it's it's the commission that the seller pays. A lot of people aren't aware of that. So, do you think that's? Do you think we're going to see more more lawsuits, more probes on this? You mean where you're? They're talking about a change where the buyer would be responsible for their half of that commission equation. And there the has been be some talk of that. It's it's hard to, for me to imagine the amount of disruption that would bring to the real estate community as a whole if if the buyer actually had to pay. You know, if, if they they uncoupled it and, you know, the buyer paid their half and the, you know, the seller paid their half. Well, they're paying for it anyway. It's well, yes. just very. So I guess you'd have to separate that out because you always have to pay for something like we have this big thing about the national debt. Yeah. All of that will eventually need to be handled at some point. So um, I think where people think it's unfair is if you have a high price, like here in California, where the average price has been getting steadily up well over half a million. So is someone, is, is an agent doing that much more work for a much significantly higher commission than it was a few years ago? I remember the depth recession when the average sales price in California was like a quarter of a million. It was like really low. And so, but they're arguably doing the same amount of work for that same amount of commission. Now you could argue, but their housing costs too are higher. Living costs are higher. So that's reflective of just higher living costs here. But I think people look at that line item and think, wait a minute, I paid $2,000 for a commission, whatever number of years ago. Now I'm paying 10 or 15 for the same amount of work. So I think that's where people are getting a little frustrated. So that's where agents have to really sell their value on something. And again, if you're making so much money off of a house and it was quick and easy and it, you didn't lose your mind over it, then that's still a good investment. It's just part of the equation. Absolutely. Uh, next question coming in from Five Father asking about innovation and disruption going on to help homeowners rent out a home similar to the way iBuyers are modernizing the experience of selling a home. I am seeing some, and maybe Patrick, you're seeing this too, some startups that are creating sort of, I would call them rental property management platforms where they it's property management, but it's also bookkeeping taxes it's kind of everything but they're paying out uh they're paying out quarterly and they're charging you know they're making they're charging fees based on based on what what rent you're bringing in are you seeing that as i feel like it's still a small very very emerging category but have you seen anything on that well you know i had used it for long-term rentals where everything's automated and it makes it really easy for short-term rentals i think it depends how expensive they get so I have a brother and his wife just bought a home in Tennessee somewhere that they're going to rent out and it's rented 365 days a year and it's rented three. And so they're going to try to manage it on their own because they have some experience doing that. So it's be interesting to see how they do that. I think they may find that it's so time intensive that you start to look at your opportunity cost of your time doing this, doing something else, then maybe it's time to bring someone on. I think if they get really expensive at first, like some of them be 30%. To fill a rental. Well, that's a lot of money over a year. Maybe you're better off hiring your own uh, person. What, I, which, what I've seen lately is people who worked in hospitality starting their own businesses, like just very bespoke. It's just an individual. It's not maintaining an office. So their, their fees are a lot more reasonable where they handle the handyman and the cleaning. And now you don't have to have keys. You can just have codes. And I know there was, there's been issues like an Airbnb 
with giving keys out in a public place. Well, who has those keys? There's a big story in Bloomberg Business Week about this. Yes, I and saw that. Now you're having electronic codes that you can change all the time. So I think you're going to have, yeah, if you like, let's say you worked in hospitality, you helped work at a hotel, your assistant manager. That's an ideal background to help people manage their properties. Well, we've got about 15 minutes left. I wanted to dive into some of the research that we're going to publish on Million Acres this week because you had some really interesting results. You put as a, as a top market Jackson, Mississippi, and that really surprised me. So sell me on Jackson. What, what should people know about Jackson, Mississippi if you're a real estate investor? Well, affordability. I think the average house was 160 something thousand versus a national average for that month of like 280. 287. This is according to Redfin. So it's a significant haircut off what you pay nationally. And then the rents are also affordable. And then I took a look at their average uh, income. Like what are average monthly wages? And what is that a percentage of rent? And it's about a third. So it's not cheap, but the national one using that same one was almost 40%. So what that means is that if you're going to invest in rental property in Jackson. People maybe aren't as stretching as much for that rent as they are somewhere else. So you're going to have more stable tenants. And I think the, the uh, vacancy rate was, was fairly low. I think vacancy rates, you want it to be about 5%. Again, that's for equilibrium in the market. So significantly below that, then it's certainly, you know, a landlord's market. And Jackson is in the middle of the state. It's the state capital. They have a new convention center. They're trying to bring in tourism. They have a big music scene, uh, like the city of blues, I think is their, their motto. And so again, when it came up as the top, I think the ratio is 9.69% in terms of just that really kind of basic yield before expenses. But that's certainly better than you can get with most bonds, most safe bonds. It's what you're going to get better than savings. And if you don't want to be the highs and downs of the stock market, I know the stock market was down a lot today because the report that came out that people are having trouble hiring workers. Again, this is going to sort itself out over the next few months. Yes. But I think it's a combination of affordability so you can get into something really inexpensive. Um, it's an interesting place with a lot of history and the rents aren't that high. So I think for starter landlords, and I know a lot of people don't like renting out of their areas. And that used to be in my family. That was you never buy anything more 90, you know, 90 miles away from home because it's too hard to manage. Well, technology's changed that. So now you have people buying all over the country because you have local people that you could put in. Everyone's online now. They made it so much easier. So for that reason, you know, maybe I would even look at a, a place like Jackson. I've kind of peaked. My interest has been peaked in that area. Number two is Memphis mm -hmm. for all sorts of different reasons. So, yeah, the South is a lot of markets in the South, North Carolina on that list, Ohio. So what you're seeing is like some Rust Belt cities are kind of really reinventing themselves. Um, and new companies moving in and expanding and a lot of entrepreneurial work. A lot of new businesses were started over the past year. I think you're seeing a new kind of resurgence in remote work and entrepreneurialism. And that may benefit some of these kind of outlying areas that you might not have thought of like Jackson. Well, and I think you also made a point here that I really want to uh, dive in on, which is this idea of best market for real estate investors may not be the one where rents are highest, but it may be the one where rents are at a rate that people can actually afford them. Because I think that is when we're looking at, I mean, the last year with the eviction moratoriums, we're, we're not even close to sorting out all of the impact of that. There is a lot of value to having rent in a place where, where it's not taking up 50, 60% of, you know, of your renter's household income. Yeah, like here in LA um, or in California, I, I ran that same yield. And it's like 2%. So that's not a great investment. Now, if you bought years ago and you have low fixed costs, it's a great market to be in because rents have slowly gone up. So yeah, to your point, I'm not sure you want the widest pool of people to buy your unit. And as an investor, what I've always done is I tend to be about 10% under market. And that keeps my turnover really low because it's expensive, you got to update, and then you lose all that rent. And not having the highest and the best, because that 
that's good for people who know what they're doing in terms of the luxury, but you might have more turnover and you have a smaller pool of people to choose from. So that's why I look at markets where, yeah, where people are not spending more than 30 or a third, like a max a third. You're getting up to what you're talking, 50, 60. That's tough because then you have multiple people pooling in to make that run every month. And what happens if someone's roommate doesn't make it and they're responsible for the lease? And yeah, it's just, I think the largest pool of potential applicants is always the best way to go. True, because that's what we saw with, with San Francisco and New York during the pandemic. We saw uh, rents dropped dramatically. In San Francisco, at one point, they were down about 30% year over year coming back now, but in those, in those markets where rent was really, really high, it seemed like there was more room for rent to immediately drop because so many people picked up stakes. I mean, New York is going to come back. San Francisco is going to come back. I'll never bet against a city, but I do believe that there has been, there's going to be some permanent price correction there. Well, also because of remote work, I did yes. kind of just for fun, uh, looked at data in terms of what percentage of people could work remotely in San Jose. And that market was far above anything else. And we know where you are. They went to Lake Tahoe. They bid up yes. the prices there. So are they going to come back? It depends on their employer. Again, so Apple wants, I think, people in on Wednesdays and Fridays. And they're saying, no, we want you in these two days a week. And then some other companies, are like Microsoft and Google, I think they're kind of all sort of figuring it out still. And you keep... I think a pretty big portion of people are saying, well, if I can't re work remotely like I did their pandemic, I'm going to look, I'm going to look to work for someone else. And you're going to see who kind of wins. I call that the battle of the workplace. I mean, some workplaces, you can't do it. You know, well, they're, they're calling people. this the, uh, what are they calling it? The great resignation. I've seen, you know, the, the news always gets us a hold of an idea, but uh, I do had mentioned it earlier. You've got uh, certainly restaurants, retail, hospitality, all looking for workers. But you also have these other workers, like you mentioned before, that they've just decided it's it's remote or nothing for me. And so that that is really going to, that may keep some of these remote resort, resort markets alive because you mentioned Tahoe. Tahoe had a huge year. The Hamptons had a big year. Aspen had a big year. So many of these resort markets, uh, which had a lot of inventory because there weren't a lot of sales in them, went through their inventory quickly and you know just had really, really odd years. And it's sort of a question of whether that or not that's going to be an anomaly. Yeah. And they're, and they're crowding out long time people live there. So you're getting resentment from people who've lived there for a long time. These people that come in and don't, and so now there's a sensitivity about, yeah, I'm moving to Lake Tahoe, which I didn't use to, but I'm going to become involved in the community. I'm going to become involved in the fabric of the community. I saw a story about that, that people are sort of sensitive to that because they, they know they're pricing things out. And I read a story about someone who lived there for years and she's a frontline worker, I think at a restaurant, and then had to move to another side of the lake. And thank God she found a landlord re willing to rent for her because other people are just saying, well, I'm going to sell while the prices are high and get out of this market. And then people come in with all this money who can work remotely. And so that's, yeah, change the fabric. Again, yeah, to your point, this is gonna take time to sort out. You know, this is, we, we're in a time of animal spirits, I think still, which is a term coined by Robert Schiller, Dr. Robert Schiller, about how people sort of get on this train and just this, they get excited about where things are going. And it's sort of this frenzy that has a lot of psychological underpinnings to it. And I think we're still somewhat in the middle of that. I think that the single family rental uh, boom that everyone's talking about is part of that too, because you've got Blackstone involved in these big, in the big single family rental deal. You've got uh, Fundrise raising 300 million from Goldman Sachs to go all in on build to rent. You've got this single family rental boom that may or may not be, be permanent, but right now that I think that COVID desire for more space has kind of pushed people a little bit away from, from condos, from communities, from, uh, you know, from living together in smaller spaces. Yeah. Yeah. For now. And I yeah. think some people are going to really love that and, and want to stick with that. And you're going to have some other people that kind of miss the cities. I mean, New York is on its way back up again. Uh, I wouldn't count out LA either. You know, like I mentioned before, going out to other places and coming back after a year. And but that's why I mentioned the demographics. So if you're in a multi-generational household 
and a distant suburb, maybe that's perfect for you because you have kids and maybe you have the grandparents to help babysit. It depends where you are in your life. So if I'm on Gen Z and I want to be at work because I want to make all those relationships to further my career, I probably want to be in the city because I'm single and I get to meet other people. So it'd be interesting to kind of, a, if someone did a demographic split of, of age groups for these different cities to see how this is playing out and test this theory. Well, here's the thing that, that I start to think about with that, though, is, okay, so you've got younger workers, they want to be in the office, maybe other workers don't want to be in the office, but then you've sort of self-selected a different type of office culture that is going to be different than the office culture that they would have gotten in a normal, in a in you know traditional situation where they would have been exposed to a wide variety of people, but now there's a chance that like maybe they're in the office with their coworkers, but their manager is only coming in, you know, twice a week or something like that. It starts to shift how the dynamics of the workplace, you know, really work long term. And I think that's kind of fascinating. I think that there is a hidden uh, there's a hidden problem in there, and I think that's one of the reasons that that Apple is is trying to figure out, you know, which days are the best ones for people to come in because you're going to lose some of those, you know, it sounds so cheesy, but those water cooler conversations, you're going to lose some of those innovation moments that are so hard to, you know, to quantify and qualify because you it's like when you think about building design, right? They've, there've been all these studies about trying to create those incidental moments where people meet up and have casual conversation. That is kind of going to be self-selected out to the, only the groups of people that actually want to be in the office. It's, it's fascinating to think about how this is going to have long-term ramifications. Yeah. I and mean, what if it's all Gen Y's, you know, and a couple <laughs> exactly. of senior execs, you know, and they're like, wait a minute, I'm not, you're doing what I exact. You're at the same event that I was over the weekend, and and where am I learning new things? So to your point, maybe that's why companies like Apple are saying, "No, we want you in two days a week. We're going to test this out." And and there's nothing to say that can't be modified in the future. But to be able to have those mingling of people, I mean, I remember jobs I've worked where people were open to it. I'd go to someone else, a completely different area, and say. Hey, can you take me under your wing and just teach me about this thing that I don't know about? And sometimes they'd say yes. Sometimes they'd say no. But they always had more experience. They weren't like an age peer or an experienced peer. They were someone who were an ex- expert in that area. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting because Zoom can't really replace all that. No, Zoom, Zoom can't. Zoom and Slack can't quite replace the the casual encounter, those those incidental conversations. And I think so much of that is is when I'm thinking about real estate, I'm thinking about office, but I'm also thinking about residential. How do they all work together? There's so much that is is kind of things are dependent on each other. Office is dependent on where residential goes and it's all sort of connected. And yet now we're sort of decoupling them in a way that hasn't happened before. And that's really the short-term ramifications that we've seen are interesting, but it's the long-term trends that I think we, we really don't know. And it's just, it's, I don't know how long it's going to take till we do know the office shakeout. What is your thought on that as we wrap up? Do you think it's a five-year thing that we know we'll know sort of whether or not people are, you know, going to be hybrid workers, remote workers? How long do you think this whole cycle is going to take to go through? I think we'll know more before five years. I would probably look at markets. You know, most of the large commercial brokerages come out with at least sometimes monthly, usually quarterly. I probably look at these markets like every six months just to see what are we seeing in this and what quality of office space is changing. So the class A is going to be, okay, if you're downtown in class A office building, you're going to have to more add more amenities, get people to come in. If you're class B or C on the periphery, you're going to have more problems in terms of attracting tenants. So that's just from the supply side that I'm reading. So I guess every six months, I, I, five years kind of long, I would say, at the end of the year in the fall, when we come back, kids go back to school. I know people are demanding more childcare on site. That's one thing. There's like, oh, yeah, definitely. That people get, and the pandemic accelerates things. I'm giving a speech at the end of the month that's focusing on the changes, accelerating pandemics, and what they've happened in the past and how this happening. And in the past, cities always rebounded, except they didn't have remote work. So that's a big wrinkle on this. 
that we're going to see play out. I think now every six months I'd look at it. I think we'll know more a year from now and yeah, six months I, from now. I think we're going to definitely see things shift in the fall. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for coming on today and just chatting, chatting with all of us about this. I think it's, it's really important stuff.